Yo, what's going on, everybody? We are back with another one. So obstacles to opportunity live in the building. So today we're going to be going over the income inequality. Well, that's a big ass myth. Okay. How the government biases in their policy actually takes the money from the rich and gives to the poor on a constant basis. So the, the government's already net net Robin Hood, but let's dive into it, right? Government transfer payments. The resources available to American households are not determined only by 13 trillion of the income they earn producing value with their labor and with investments of the fruits of their thrift. The total resources available for consumption are also determined by the 2.8 trillion of government transfer payments received. That's a lot of money, guys. So 0.2 trillion of private transfer payments and the 4.4 trillion of taxes paid. After receiving transfer payments and paying taxes, American households in 2017 had 11.7 trillion of available income, one fourth of which has been redistributed through taxes and transfer payments. So the redistribution of wealth is real, right? Table 2.2 shows federal, state, and local transfer payments, which totaled 2.8 trillion and accounted for almost 22% of all household income in 2017. Over 41% of those transfer payments went to bottom households, right? The 27% went to households in the second and then transfer payments made from more than 100 different federal programs constituted 93% of all government transfers. That's a lot. The remaining 7% came from programs funded by state and municipalities. So the majority of the money, again, always comes from the top, redistributed back out to the lower people in the court tile. So again, we're paying some of the largest amounts to people on the lower income. And then the fifth largest federal transfer payments are broken out separately. The proportion of the senior population that meet the minimum age 62, and maybe it might be different from this publishing of the book, satisfy the required history of qualifying earnings and elected to start its benefits receive transfer payments from Social Security, old age and survivors insurance. Disabled in individuals under the full retirement age of 66 receive the benefits from Social Security Disability Insurance called DI. Individuals over the age of 65, which require tax earnings, history, and all DI beneficiaries were eligible to receive Medicare transfer payments to pay all or part of their medical bills. So people don't take that into account also when they're thinking about that. They're just going off of how much they see the rich making and they don't look at all these benefits and programs that they're receiving, especially not even going to get into grants for home ownership. Shout outs to Harris. She wants to give that 25,000. But prior to that, there's still programs from the federal and state level that provide that money for lower and middle income individuals, not higher income individuals. And so these Social Security and Medicare benefits were paid by taxes collected from the current working population and with more taxes being collected from those in the higher queues in the higher bracket in the higher side based on their greater earnings and this transfer of earnings from the higher people to retired individuals in the lower level is a major factor in reducing income inequality in addition to these transfers from one generation to the earlier generations there are transfers within the generation of workers and so the Social Security system grants disproportionately higher benefits to low income workers for every dollar they paid into tax. So the lower income workers get more out of the program than what they put in. And the net result is the Social Security requirement benefits relative to the Social Security taxes paid are five times greater for lower earners than for higher earners. So when we have a conversation about income inequality, we don't take into all these programs for all these benefits, they equate into money also. Like if I'm looking at my financial portfolio and I'm not counting tax deductions, like that's not a full picture of my financial situation, right? <laughs> like it doesn't make any sense. You're just looking at my income only. And there's so many other things. Like when people talk about the national debt, we talked about this before, right? They only talk about the national debt. They don't talk about the GDP and they don't talk about the net worth, the assets, the overall wealth of American overall. How many assets do we have underneath our custodians? Right? They don't talk about that. The impact of Medicare benefits on reducing income inequality is even more pronounced because every Medicare beneficiary receives the same hospitalization insurance coverage, Part A, in respect to the amount of income they earned. And so, 
again, th that creates that difference. As a result, in 2017, on average, bottom the bottom earners received Medicare hospitalization benefits 23 times larger relative to the taxes they paid than was received by the top earners. So who's getting most out of the system is the people in the lower tier, but that's not counted into income inequality and et cetera. So those guys are making a lot. They're paying a lot in taxes, meaning the higher bracket, but then that's redistributed, not back out in money, right? They don't say, hey, man, give me a hundred thousand. I'm gonna give it down to this poor person. It's more, hey, give me that hundred thousand dollars and I'm gonna give it to them in a different program. The same program you could apply for, yes, but you're gonna get less out of it and pay more into it. They're gonna pay less into it and get more out of it. There goes the inequality, right? So you're looking at income inequality, but there's benefits in inequality, right? Grants in inequality, loans that are in inequality, like massive amounts of things that are unequal, and that wealth does get redistributed out. So Medicare beneficiaries are assessed premiums to coverage medical and drug benefits, Part B and D, and just as with any other insurance. However, these premiums are heavily subsidized with transfer payments from general revenues, disability benefits, and about 20% of elderly beneficiaries with the lowest incomes pay no premium because they are fully covered by subsidies. So there we go, subsidies. And I'm not really mad about elders receiving this money. We're just bringing that up so people can understand that. Beneficiaries receive subsidies um, that pay for 75% of their premiums, and the top earners receive subsidies that fund 20% of their premiums. See the difference, right? And so they're going to keep talking about, let's say, disability and all this other stuff. Let's get into some other programs. The next large, largest transfer program, food stamps. Y'all heard about that, right? Food stamps, a government block cheese and all that nonsense, officially known as the Supplemental uh, Nutrition Assistant Program, SNAP, is one of the 12 different federal programs providing food assistance to lower income households in 2017. And then it was a source of income subsidies totaling at 63.7 billion in benefits for 42.3 million people, roughly one eighth of Americans. So they received that, but again, in that inequality conversation, we're not gonna have to actually discuss this. In addition to these five income transfer programs, some 95 other federal programs each distribute more than 100 million annually. So imagine if I was making $100,000 a year and I had to pay for no food because I received benefits from programs. Like net net, that would reduce my overall you could say overhead and expenses on my cost of living, right? Like, cause I don't need to pay for food, which is good. Cause you know, maybe food can run somebody 400, $600 a month, right? And if you got 400 and $600 a month available to you, you could possibly invest some of that money. So please open up my budget, pay for my accommodation and pay for my food. Shoot, if I did that, I'd be shelling got dang $4,000 a month into the stock market <laughs> instead of spending it on food and housing. So let's continue. In addition to these five income transfer programs, I only mentioned about two, but there's more, so you can check out the book. They range from relatively large, broad-based initiatives like temporary assistance for needy families and supplemental security income and a student Pell grant. So remember that, you know, reducing, canceling out student debt, the cash payments for refundable tax credits to more narrowly targeted transfers like the Royal Rental Assistance Program, the Indian Health Service, and the Title I Migration Education Program. So all these programs, all this money is being shelled out. Majority of that money that's available for all these programs come from the top earners. So inequality in many ways, right? In total, these 95 programs and other smaller programs are distributed an average of $4,214 to every household in America, with an average of $9,126 going to the bottom of households and $7,021 to the second, second level, and then even the middle and upper levels received some smaller amounts of these benefits. So basically, almost none of these benefits, but the people who get it, they're winning, right? They ain't got no problem. They're like, bro, we up. Excuse me. That's just the end of the actual, let's say. All right. So after we do the snap, after we read that, let's go to Medicaid. Medicare and a few smaller transfer payment programs are financed jointly by the federal and state funds. And table 2.2, we already seen that, combines both federal and state funds for these programs over the federal heading because beneficiaries get single combined benefit that is not differentiated by funding source. And the total for the program is more interest than its this exact source of funds. So again, all this is not taken into account. Let's go back into this book so I can show you some other parts. 
that are really interesting. I think I highlighted this. We're going to go back and we're going to see. Overall, this book is really trying to point out in the calculations, in the things that you see, your perception of history is kind of, let's say, jaded because you don't have all the information. You're not evaluating the entire portfolio. Instead, you're evaluating some markers or some measurements, but not all of them. It's kind of, once again, you're going to look at my debt, but you're not looking at my earned income. You're not looking over my net worth. You're like, oh, man, ah, obstacles. You're screwed. You're at $2 million of debt. And I'm like, yeah, but I own over $50 million in assets. So that's not really that serious, but you think it is. All right, here we go. So preface of this book, right? I gave you the, the heavy stuff already, right? The potatoes and meat. I gave that to you just now. But let's go back and kind of sprinkle in some seasons so you can see the overall picture. The lesson of history and our perception of the present have profound effects on the future. In the last 200 years and to an ever increasing degree since the dawn of information age, both history and our perception of the world we are living in is based to a significant degree on statistical measures. And we may have the ability through our direct observations to perceive our own well being, but we rely on standard statistical measures like inflation adjusted gross domestic product, uh, economic growth, productivity, and poverty rate to form a perception of our national well-being and meaning household income. Average hourly earnings and income distribution to gauge our own relative well-being. So sometimes most people don't want to use data and information to gauge the situation in the United States or any other situation. They want to use what they feel. And while that's all fine and dandy of what you feel and experience, the data and information proves otherwise. So you're just going to ask yourself what question am I going to focus on the data and make an actual reasonable, logical decision? Or am I going to focus on the emotion and make an irrational decision about my future and what I'm going to do from this point out? It is hard to overstate the importance of getting our facts straight concerning basic statistical measures of well-being, public policy, the role of the government, and ultimately our freedom and happiness depend on knowing the facts. So this is why I'm trying to provide that. The truth can make us free only if we know the truth. And since this book is about getting the facts straight, and since getting the facts straight will affect our prosperity, freedom, and happiness, the subject matter of this book is vitally important. Again, let's get it straight so you guys can get your life straight. This book is a joint effort by three authors, and then he goes in and talks about the authors and et cetera, right? And we do not perish. If I left economics to do good first as a member of Congress and then as a member of the Senate, and this is a personal story, I'm trying to skip through the past, past the personal story and get down to what he's saying. In a conversation two years ago, Bob and I started talking about how American statistics measuring economic well being seemed to be at a variance with the world we lived in, right? Based on the initial conversation, we started to look more closely at the various statistical measures of well being produced by the Census Bureau and by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And during that study, we discovered that the work of John Early, and we'll skip through that. Uh, he directed, he was an officer of the Fortune 100 company and currently is the president of Vital Few LLC. So they came together and did this book. And this is not a book written by three different people, but in piece together, we researched and analyzed and wrote it together. So he's just telling you what they did, right? And while we each have our own opinions and political views, we shared a desire to get the facts straight. So they came together to get the facts straight in this book. And this book has benefited greatly from the research and technical assistance of other people. And we have tried not to be, uh, you know, doomsday individuals, but we also wanted to provide enough information to make clear that we are not being fast and loose with the facts. Getting the facts straight reveals an extraordinary accomplishment of the American economy under good policy and bad and producing uh, a plenty of which has, in fact, been widely shared. So regardless of the good and bad of politics, America has been able to produce very well. The wisdom of Mark Twain was never more evident than when he reportedly said, quote, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know ain't so. Let me run that back for you guys one more time. Let me put it on a jumbo screen. It's already there, but let me put myself on a jumbo screen. It ain't 
or what you don't know that gets you into trouble. So it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. Most people say, I don't know financial literacy. I don't know this. That's what gets me in trouble. No, that's not. It's what you know that ain't so. So the stuff that you know that actually is not so, that's what gets you in trouble. Um, the rich are evil. America sucks. The economy is the worst ever. There is no future. See, that's what you know, but it ain't so. That's what gets you in trouble. But when I attempt to have a conversation with you about hacking the American dream, you're telling me, someone who's accomplished it, someone who's financially secure and financially literate, you're a liar, that's false, I don't agree, because I think this is so. I think there's no way for me, as someone who's black, to get a loan application approved. I think someone like me as a woman has no opportunity to work in this job. I think that America is blank, 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 blank. And because of that, I can't do this. And this nation is going to hell in a handbasket. Like all these things. That's what you're saying. I think this doesn't make any sense. And that simple truth applies to individuals and nations alike. History is repelled with examples of where nations had conceptions of their well-being that were significantly different from the reality of the world in which they lived in. So you wouldn't be the first people to do this, right? And they actually go into it about, you know, Victorian England being the same way during the industrialization. But The Economist magazine's 2020 summed up the contemporary public assessment of income inequality as follows. It is a truth universally acknowledged that inequality in the rich world is high and rising, end quote. This view permeates the American political and economic debate and is generally accepted across American society. And it's not because it's the truth, it's because that's what people want to hear to excuse themselves, right? And while few are as blunt as Senator Bernie Sanders shout out to him, he expressed what appears to be a uniform opinion of all major elements of the Democratic Party and some in the Republican Party. And the quote is, the increasing level of wealth and income inequality in this country is immoral, un-American, and unsustainable. This is most normies. Whether they're on the right and left is not of my concern, but they do say this in some shape, form, or fashion. Right? Maybe the right more so says um, something's un-American and unsustainable. They do say that. Um, whether it's wealth being immoral, maybe not so. According to the Census Bureau, the average income of the top 20% households in America in 2017 is 16.7 times higher than the average income of the bottom 20% of households and income inequality has grown more or less consistently since World War II. The Census Bureau also finds that the percentage of Americans living in poverty has been largely unchanged since the war on poverty was implemented in the mid-1960s. The Bureau labels to Texas BLS data on inflation-adjusted average hourly earnings for production and non-supervisory workers led a Pew Institute to note in August 2018, quote, in real terms, average hourly earnings peaked more than 45 years ago, end quote. And if this doesn't sound like the America you live in, that is because it's not. <laughs> there are at least three dead giveaways to the fact that the official measurements of economic well-being of the Americans are wrong. And the more obvious clue is from the ramp up of the founding for the war on poverty, the funding, excuse me, from 1967 to 2017, annual government transfer payments to the average household in the bottom 20% of the income distribution rose more than fourfold in inflation adjusted dollars from 9,677 to 45,389. So all that stuff that's usually not counted on the books has increased. They just don't count it on the books, but those benefits are still there for people now i'm going to read this part that i highlighted and we're going to end out on this clearly there's something wrong here the bottom can consume more than twice its consensus income only because the census does not count two-thirds of the transfer payments their benefits right as incomes for those who receive them the census report that the top 20 percent of households remember 16.7 times as much income as the bottom 20 can be reconciled with the BLS report that they only consume 4.5 times as much only by adding value of transfer payments receiving to income of the bottom 20% and subtracting the taxes paid by the top 20%. See, they don't mention that. Well, they make so much and they get taxed more too. So there you go. This book will document that these illogical and contradictory findings 
are the product of historical decisions made by the Census Bureau over the last 75 years that have un they're counted income. In measuring income, the Census Bureau chooses not to cover two thirds of all transfer payments uh, from federal, state, and local governments as income to the recipients that receive those transfer payments. In 2017, federal, and state, and local governments redistributed 2.8 trillion, 22% of the nation's earned income, with 68% of those transfer payments going to households earning in the bottom 40%. Again, robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. And then people want to do that even more so. They want more money. Remarkably, the Census Bureau chooses to count only 0.9% of that trillion, right? And 0.9 trillion of that 2.8 trillion in government transfer pay payments as income for the recipients of those transfers, counting only eight, eight of the more than 100 federal transfer programs, programs only, a select a number of state and local transfer programs. And then so excluded from the measurement of household income are some 1.9 trillion of government transfer programs like refundable tax credits, where beneficiaries get checks from the treasury, food stamps, where beneficiaries buy food with government issued debit cards, and numerous other programs such as Medicare and Medicaid, where the government directly pays the bills to the beneficiaries. American pays, Americans pay 4.4 trillion a year in federal, state, and local taxes, 82% of which are paid by the top 40% of household earners, even though most of households never see this money because it is withheld from their paycheck. The Census Bureau does not reduce household income by the amount of taxes paid when it measures income inequality. There you have it. So what you believe is so, that's what's hurting you. Obstacles to opportunity. Everyone hates America.